This is Chapter 5, Dimensional Analysis and Similarity, Part 4. In this video, I'm going to do a solved example of dimensional analysis. This is actually a more complicated example. So if you understand this one, you should be set for the final exam. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the pi parameters for forced convective heat transfer from an isothermal cylinder in a cross flow of fluid. So this is a, an interaction of fluid flow and convective heat transfer. And then I'm going to talk about how these pi parameters greatly aid in correlating the experimental data. And I'll end by just talking about how the analysis that we completed results in some famous dimensionless parameters in heat transfer. One's called the Nusselt number after Wilhelm Nusselt. We get the Reynolds number that you've already seen and another number called the Prandtl number. So the problem we're considering is convective heat transfer from a cylinder. And at this point I should mention that you're not responsible for the theory here. This is not a course in heat transfer. Mechanical engineers will get a course in heat transfer next term. But I'm just setting up the problem and giving you enough information that you can understand it so that you can do the dimensional analysis. The task here and what you're responsible for here, of course, is understanding dimensional analysis. So the problem that we're considering is a, a cylinder, and you might consider it heated at some temperature Ts. So it's isothermal, so maybe a copper cylinder. It has diameter d and it's exposed to a forced flow, so a fluid flowing at velocity v at some temperature, fluid temperature Tf. And this is forced convection, so we're neglecting buoyancy effects, so gravity doesn't come in. The, the, the fan or the, the wind is blowing hard enough that gravity effects are negligible. Convective heat transfer is expressed in terms of this expression here. Q dot is the convective heat transfer rate. I put a dot over it to distinguish this variable from volume flow rate. We used Q for volume flow rate previously. We get Q dot equals HA TS minus TF. Now H is what's called the convective heat transfer coefficient. It's how many watts per meter squared of area per degree of temperature difference between the surface and the ambient, so watts per meter squared K. A is the surface area of the object that's exposed to the fluid, of course in meters squared. And Ts minus Tf is the surface to fluid temperature difference. And that could be in either Kelvin or degree C. It's a temperature difference, and the size of a Kelvin degree and the size of a Celsius degree are the same, so it doesn't matter either way. And this equation here, Q equals H A delta T, or Q dot equals H A delta T, is called Newton's Law of Cooling. Now you're not responsible for this in this course. I'm just setting up the problem uh, so we can do dimensional analysis on it. The mechanical engineers uh, will see this again. This is the, the mainstay of MEC701 heat transfer. So now we understand the basics of the problem, Newton's Law of Cooling. Q dot equals H A times some surface to ambient or surface to fluid temperature difference. And so in this problem statement you're told that we want to do dimensional analysis to find the pi parameters uh, that govern this problem for the heat transfer coefficient H. And H is a function of, remember these three sort of categories that we consider, H is a function of geometry. In this case, we just have the diameter of the cylinder. It's a function of fluid properties. So we have specific heat, Cp, how much energy is required to raise the temperature of the fluid by one degree. I'm sure you've seen that before. The dynamic viscosity, the thermal conductivity. You would have seen that in probably MTL 100, discussions of thermal conductivity as a property, and the density. And of course, it's a function of external effects, particularly the free stream velocity. The faster the fluid flows, the more convective heat transfer we get, and the higher this heat transfer coefficient will be. 
So this is the problem statement. You're given that h is a function of d, c, p, mu, k, rho, and v, and the problem is to find the pi parameters or the pi terms that characterize forced convective heat transfer. Now I could have just left it there, but to obtain what are sort of the famous classical dimensionless parameters for this problem, I'm going to instruct you here to use d, mu, k, and rho for the repeating variables. And you might recall that the pi parameters are not unique. If you select different repeating variables, you'll end up with slightly different but equivalent dimensionless parameters. So I, I want to end up with the classical ones here so that I can have a discussion of the famous dimensionless parameters that come about in heat transfer. So that's the problem statement. I'm going to use the method of repeating variables. There's six steps to this. Again, on a test or exam, you don't have to go this uh, rigorously and slowly and methodically, but I am going to do that in, in this video, of course. So step one is to list the n variables of the problem. Now, you're, in this case, it's done for you in the problem statement. Here, h is a function of d, c, p, mu, k, rho, and v. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, we have seven variables. And don't forget to include what's called the dependent variable, the thing you're after, h. Of course, you would normally check that all the variables are independent. In this case, you're given the seven variables, so you don't have to worry about that. But, you know, the concept is that you have included the diameter of the cylinder, so you wouldn't want to include uh, the surface area of the cylinder because they're not independent. And we've included all the relevant geometric effects, fluid properties, and external effects, those three categories that you think about when you're coming up with the list of variables. And I previously mentioned that gravity is not included. We're not including any buoyancy effects. So free convection effects are not included. This is strictly a forced convection, a steady forced convection problem. So step two, express the variables in terms of the basic dimensions. Of course, you can just go to the table in chapter one and look them up. On a test, you may not have that. So I like to go through how you would get them. And indeed, I would normally do it this way as well. So let's start with the obvious ones. So D has obviously dimensions of length. Velocity is distance over time, so length over time. So I'm happy with that. We talked about this earlier that dynamic viscosity has units of uh, mass over length time, it's kilogram over meter second. If you couldn't remember that, you can deduce that from Newton's law of viscosity, and that's covered in a previous video. And of course, density is mass per unit volume, so mass over length cubed, so I'm happy with that. So we've started with the obvious ones. Now, the next ones are a little more complex, and I just want to go through these. H, for example, I'm not sure if you'd even find that on the table in chapter one because it's not a traditional parameter in a fluids course. So H has units of watts per meter squared K. So heat transfer rate per unit area per degree of temperature difference between the surface and the fluid. So how do we get that in its basic dimensions? Well, what we do is we start simplifying terms. A watt here is a joule per second, right? So I've written joule per second and then I've written down meters squared kilogram again. Now, at joule, we want to get it in its basic form here. The joule is a newton meter. So you'll see I've got newton meter and then on the bottom again I've written second meter squared k. And then We've still not at our most basic form. We want to use the mass, length, time, temperature scheme. So it's best to stick with one of them. You could pick the other if you wanted to, but I want to use the mass scheme. So I'm going to convert the Newton here into a kilogram meter per second squared. And of course, I've crossed that meter out with that meter. And so on the bottom, we have one over 
time at you know, seconds meter k. And from that now we can cross out the meter and you can see you get mass time cubed over temperature. So not terribly painful. Now we can do the same thing for k. k has units of watts per meter of thickness per degree of temperature difference. You've seen this in MTL 100, I'm sure, in your materials course. So again, our watt becomes joule per second, and then 1 over meter k, and then joule becomes newton meter, and then I've replaced the newton meter, the, sorry, the newton with kilogram meter per second squared. And you can see then that you get mass, length, time cubed over, over temperature. And now we move on to specific heat, constant pressure specific heat, which is so many joules per kilogram K. It's how many joules required to raise one kilogram of, an, of a material through one degree Celsius. And the size of a Celsius and Kelvin degree are the same. So K and C are the same here. We're talking about temperature differences. So again, joule becomes Newton meter. Then I replace Newton with kilogram meter per second squared, and I still have the meter kilogram K. I can cancel the kilograms, and I can see that I'm going to get basic dimensions of length squared, time squared over temperature. So now we've got all of the dimensions, and I've just reproduced them there. As I say, you can look them up in a table in chapter one, or you can quite simply reproduce them this way. And then, of course, check in, in chapter one that they're correct. In some cases, you may end up with a variable like heat transfer coefficient here, where you have to deduce the basic dimensions yourself. And so it's good to get some practice at this technique. So there they are again. I've reproduced all the dimensions, the basic dimensions of our variables. Now, step three, determine the number of pi parameters. And that's k equals n minus j. n is the number of variables we have in the problem. When we counted them earlier, we have seven of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes. And j is the number of basic dimensions. Now, because we have a non-isothermal problem, we have heat transfer here, we have temperature. So we have four basic dimensions, mass, length, temperature, and time. So from Buckingham Pi theorem, we say that we're going to have k dimensionless products, n minus j, that's 7 minus 4. We're going to end up with three dimensionless pi parameters. There they are again, the variables that we're using and their basic dimensions. Now the, the next step is to select j repeating variables from the n variables, where j is the number, j equals 4 is the number of basic dimensions that you have. Remember, we have mass, length, time, and temperature. So we have four basic dimensions. So we're going to select four repeating variables from the list of seven. Now this could be done a number of different ways, but I want you to be able to get the classical dimensions list parameters for this problem. So you've been told in the problem actually to which are the repeating variables here. You've been told to pick diameter, dynamic viscosity, conductivity, and rho as repeating variables. And if you picked a different set, you'd get slightly different but equivalent dimensionless parameters. And to be honest, for most testing situations, you'll probably be told which of the parameters to pick as the repeating variables because we want all the students to get the same, uh, the same answer. So that's probably going to be the case in a test as well. Nevertheless, even if you're told to pick these four repeating variables, you want to check that they satisfy the rules for repeaters. So the rules are all the reference dimensions, mass, length, time, and temperature must be included in the repeaters. And so we're going to check that here, right? You can, and you can see that's true. In fact, I think if you just look at K as one of the repeaters here, and you can see that K has all the basic dimensions. So that's definitely satisfied. Now, you also want to check that these four 
repeaters here, these four repeaters, cannot themselves form a dimensionless product. Now, in the previous video, I did this by inspection, but personally, I can't do it by inspection when it gets this complicated. It requires a rigorous check. And here's, here's how you do that, that rigorous check to make sure that this is not possible. So what you do is you set up your four repeaters, D, mu, K, and, and rho, and you set them to exponents, little a, little b, little c, little d. And then I've replaced them with their basic dimensions. So d has dimensions of length, dynamic viscosity, mass, length over time. k, we just did this on the previous slide, mass, length, time cube, temperature, and then density, mass per unit volume. So I can see that's correct. And raised to the a, B, C, D. We want to see if these can form a dimensionless product so that have no exponents on M, L, T, or temperature, theta. And so now we match exponents one by one. And so let's look at the exponents for, for theta. Theta only appears on this side. So that's going to be actually would be minus C equals zero. So you can tell from just looking at theta that c has to be zero. Now let's look at the exponents for time here. So we have minus b minus 3c and then there's no time in this term has got to equal zero. So I agree with that minus b minus 3c but we have that c zero therefore b must equal zero. Now we look at the exponents for m. So coming over here, we have b plus c plus d must equal 0 here, right? So I agree with that. And we have that c and b are 0, so d is 0. Now we look at the exponents for l. So we have a minus b plus c minus 3d equals 0. And we have that d0, we have the b0, and c0, therefore a must be 0. And so that proves conclusively, and frankly, it's the only way I can do it. Uh, maybe you can see this uh, by inspection, but I find it difficult. But that's a rigorous way to prove that, that there are no non-zero values of a, b, c, and d that can form a dimensionless product with those repeating variables. If you did find a a set of values for a, b, c, and d that did form a dimensionless product, you'd have to go back and select a different set of four repeaters. But we're okay in this case. And you would expect it to be the case because you were told to pick those four variables. But nevertheless, you should do that check. Okay, so we have our four repeating variables and we have three non-repeaters left. The three non-repeaters are h, the thing we're after, of course, the dependent variable, velocity, and cp. Those are the things we're left with as non-repeaters. And what we do is we go one by one. And traditionally, what you do is you pick pi one, you pick the thing you're after, your, your uh, there's a circle here that comes up, yeah. You start with the dependent variable, the thing you're after, h, to form pi 1. So what we do is we set up our four repeating variables that we just picked, d, mu, k, and rho, and we put h out front without an exponent. And now we want to find the values of a, b, c, and d that will make this product uh, dimensionless. So it has no exponents on m, l, t, or theta. Now we go one by one, just as we always do. So we look at the exponents of theta, and I've done these in a sort of very optimal order. Another way to do this would be just to write down the four equations and then play around with them to figure out what the, uh, what the constants a, b, c, and d are. But I'm going to do them in sort of the optimal order. So looking at this, we have theta appears in this term, so that's minus 1, theta appears in this term, which is minus c, and that's got to equal, of course, 0 on this side. So minus 1 minus c equals 0, so c equals minus 1. I agree with that. 
Now I'm going to look at the exponents for time. So here we have minus 3, here we have minus b, minus 3c, and there's nothing for time here equals 0. So I agree with that. Now I've solved for b, so b is going to equal minus 3 minus 3c, and I've made that substitution in there. So that's going to be minus 3 plus 3 means that b is 0. I agree with that. Now looking at the exponents for m, we have 1 plus b plus c plus d equals 0. Yeah, 1 plus b plus c plus d equals 0. And since I already have b and c, I already have these two, I'm going to solve for d. So d equals, let me check this, minus 1 minus b minus c, agreed. And then I've made the substitutions. b is 0 and c is minus 1. And so you have minus 1 plus 1 and that gives d equals 0. Agreed. Now the exponents for L. So we have a minus b plus c minus 3d. I agree with that. And the one thing that we don't have here, we have c, we have b, we have d. I'm going to solve for a. So I've solved for a equals b minus c plus 3d, and then I make the substitutions. d is, of course, 0, and c is minus 1, and b is 0, so we get a equals 1. I agree with that. Now we do the back substituting. We substitute, okay, let's check this. So a was 1, b was 0, c is minus 1, and d is 0. So yes, there we go. And then if we put it in the form, this form, we get that pi 1 is hd upon k. So that's our first pi parameter involving the dependent variable h, the thing we're after, the heat transfer coefficient. So now we move on, and now we form the same form of a pi parameter, pi 2, but this time we use the second non-repeating variable, v. So what I've done here, same thing, there's the four repeating variables, and this time out front we have v with no exponent. And again, I've replaced each variable with its basic dimensions. You can see here is length over time is for velocity, and that's all got to be dimensionless. So we can go term by term here, or exponent by exponent. So the exponents for theta. Theta only appears in the k term here, so we get indeed minus c equals 0, or c equals 0. Exponents for time, we have minus 1, minus b, minus 3c, there's no time in the row term, equals 0. So I agree with that. And so now I've got that c is 0, so I'm going to get that b equals minus 1. Agreed. Now the exponents for m, we have b plus c plus d equals 0. I agree with that. And we have b and we have the c 0. So uh, I'm going to solve for d, d equals minus b, so that gives d equals 1. Agreed. Now the exponents for l, we have 1 plus a minus b up here, plus c minus 3d equals, of course, 0. So that's correct. Now we have c, b, and d, so I'm going to solve for a. So a equals minus 1 plus b minus c plus 3d. Agreed. I got that. Okay, now c is 0, and so we have minus 1, and b is minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and then d is 1, so 3 times 1, and you get a is 1. That's correct. So now we do our back substitution. Let's check this out. For pi 2, v, d to the a, a is 1, agreed. b is minus 1, c is 0, and d is 1. And so we get this expression here for pi 2. And of course, 
you should recognize that as the, as the Reynolds number. Now moving along, the last one, the last pi parameter is obtained by using CP as the non-repeating variable. So again, we put the non-repeater out front. We've got our four repeaters, D, mu, K, and rho. Now I've replaced CP here with its basic dimensions, L squared over times squared theta, and we repeat the process. Looking at the exponents for theta, we have minus 1, minus c equals 0. I agree with that, and that gives c then equals minus 1. For time, we have minus 2, minus b, minus 3c. I agree with that, and we have already have for c, so we can solve for b. So b equals minus 2, minus 3c. And I'm going to make that substitution in there. And that's going to be minus 2 plus 3, so that gives b equals 1. Agreed. Now, carrying on for the exponents for m, we have b plus c plus d equals 0. And we already have b and c, so I'm going to solve for d in this case. So d equals minus b minus c, and that says minus 1, minus minus 1, and that gives d equals 0. Agreed. Now the exponents for L. We have 2 plus a minus b plus c minus 3d equals 0. So I agree with that expression. Now what's the one we don't have? Okay, we've got everything, we just don't have a. So I've solved this for a. So a, of course, equals minus 2 plus b minus c plus 3d, and then making the substitutions. So minus 2, and then b is 1, and then c is minus 1, so it's going to be minus minus 1, and then, of course, d is 0. Okay, so that gives minus 2 plus 1, and then plus another 1, which gives 0. So now making the substitutions. In the pi 3 parameter, we have a equals 0, b equals 1, that's correct, c equals minus 1, and d equals 0. And so we get, when we put it in the form, this form, we get cp dynamic viscosity over conductivity as our final pi parameter. So those are our three pi parameters. So we've shown that this problem can be resolved in terms of three dimensionless parameters. Now, step six says what you do is you take your three parameters and you put it in this form. Pi one equals some function of pi two plus pi three. And you always make sure that you have your dependent variable, the thing you're looking for, which is h, in the numerator, in other words, in the top of the of pi 1. And so when you do that, you get an expression like this. hd upon k is some function of vd rho upon mu, which is the Reynolds number, and then this other dimensionless parameter, which is a ratio of fluid properties. And that's the answer. Of course, that's as far as you'd be expected to go on an exam, but I want to make just a few extra comments here just to demonstrate the utility of this result. This result really has become the backbone of forced convection analysis, which the mechanical engineers are going to see next term in MEC 701 heat transfer. So that's our answer, and you can express it in terms of three dimensionless numbers that have subsequently become uh, famous. HD upon K is the Neusalt number, named after Wilhelm Neusalt, a German engineer. You can see now we're getting into the 20th century. Pi 2, you already know, is the Reynolds number. Uh, English engineer Osborne Reynolds, famous for work in fluid mechanics. By the way, uh, Wilhelm Neusalt is just a giant in heat transfer, has done so much pioneering work in the field of heat transfer. If you take a course in heat transfer, you'll hear his name come up 
repeatedly. And then pi 3 is the Prandtl number, this ratio of fluid properties, Cp mu upon k, named after Ludwig Prandtl, another German engineer famous for work on boundary layer theory. And I'm sure we'll be talking about that more in, probably in fluids too, you'll hear about, the mechanical engineers will hear more about boundary layer theory. And so you know, what you'll see if you look up in a heat transfer textbook, and you're not responsible for this, of course, is you'll see correlations, empirical correlations, based on experimental data where the Neusselt number is a function of the Reynolds number and Prandtl number. So remember, Prandtl number here is this ratio of fluid properties. So if you fix the fluid, if you fix the fluid, if that's a constant, the this is like a dimensionless heat transfer rate over here, or heat transfer coefficient. It's only a function of the Reynolds number. And so this problem really reduces to a single curve. And it's really quite an amazingly complex problem to come down to such a, a simple solution. So these are measurements over six orders of magnitude of Reynolds number here from, from Reynolds number of 0.1 well into uh, Stokes flow up to 3 times 10 to the 5. So this is the Reynolds number and then here we have this, this dimensionless parameter called the Neusselt number and you can see the curve here and the little circles represent the experimental data of many researchers. And so you can see the incredible utility of dimensional analysis for reducing complex problem, a problem that involves seven different variables down to such a, a simple curve. Of course you'd get different curves for different fluids. So the Prandtl number for air, that ratio of fluid property Cp mu upon k happens to be 0.7. In fact, most gases have a Prandtl number of 0.7. So this is not just for air, this is for any gas that has that Prandtl number. So this would apply to nitrogen and oxygen. It'd be pretty much the same Prandtl number. Now if you get to other fluids like water and liquid mercury, then the Prandtl numbers are significantly different and you get another single curve. But nevertheless, it tremendously reduces the amount of uh, experiments that are needed to characterize the heat transfer from a cylinder. And of course, you could do this with other shapes and force convection from objects is of tremendous importance industrially. It's involved in heat exchangers, and uh, the cooling of your computer is a force convection problem. So this is a very important result. As I say, you're not responsible for the heat transfer result, but you are responsible for understanding the dimensional analysis that's involved. And that completes this video.